Welcome, Dr. James Beckett, Sports Card Insights. I'm here with uh, Schrader Shaw, who uh, contacted me uh, with an interesting, not a proposition, but a concept. And, and uh, I said, well, let me turn on the recorder and we'll get acquainted. And uh, I decided to title this Executive Instinct. Schrader is a member of an organization that I'm also a member of that includes some CEOs and presidents of companies. That the, the goal is to educate and inform and, and assist to be a more effective uh, executive. And I, I've been in that for a long time. Schrader's been in it as well. As I found out, there's very different approaches. If you're the president of a company and you're a collector, then you bring that to your collecting experience. And if you're not the president of the company, it depends on not just what kind of collar you wear, but how you approach your job. So Schrader and I had some things in common and so we just entitled uh, this episode Executive Instincts. I enjoyed it. It was a different thing. Thanks, Schrader. Thanks, uh, sponsors, Top Spinini, Upper Deck, Heritage Auctions, Hugs and Scott Auctions, Mike Stadium Sports Cards, Burbank Sports Cards, Compsy.com, and Beckett Media, Beckett Grading, Beckett Authentication. So, again, a little bit different, uh, Sports Card Insights or uh, Sports Card Industry Insights. Thanks, Schrader, for, for your suggestion. Great to meet you, Schrader. Your backdrop. Is that uh, Babe Ruth is a Red Sox behind you? Oh, head? yeah, that's a picture of a card given away at the National many years ago. Yeah. And uh, obviously that card never existed. First of all, I love Babe Ruth. It's aesthetically pleasing red. And it's a great reminder. I always have a strong balance sheet because that's why the Red Sox had to get rid of them. <laughs> they were cash poor and uh, what a deal. It yeah. only set them back a hundred years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Another thing too about talent. Don't let go of talent. Find another way. Very true. I think uh, a lot of my success, I, I had some great teammates, but it's not every company can hire for passion for the field. I had a hobby right. that turned into a business and right. I could hire other hobbyists that were smart, good integrity, right. hardworking. And they loved it. I grew up, I would just pine to go to the card shop and not for the cards, but to read your magazine. Yeah. And I'm telling you, we were at my mom's house and there's folded pages of these Beckett's. And remember the one summer when Don Mattingly, who's my favorite player, hit like home runs for six days in a row. And he was on the cover of one of the Beckett's and there's prices circled. And I would buy, you know, it led me to my love of the stock market. It, it's such a fundamental neat hobby uh, that teaches you so many things about life and about relationships. I'm trying to teach my son. He cracked open some cards and he goes, Hey dad, what do you think I should sell this for at the card show? I said, Hey, big guy, that's up to you. I just stood back. Those things, some people learn them at 23, 24, 25, but we were learning them at 12. Exactly. But collecting is more solitary and neighborhood yeah. back in the day. Now it's digital, it's social media, it's uh, learning ecosystem. And kids can compete with their dads because they can learn, they can track the market. So it's the you, greatest you, hobby. You made a great point. You said kids actually know more. These kids, when they're going from show to show, and they know more about you know, the value of some of these cards. So they're making deals. They're, and it's impressive. They've got less cares of the world, too. I mean, yeah. They, they yeah. can be really focused. Yeah, I, I think it teaches focus and it's doing a little bit of research. But then you got to be able to read people. And some of these kids are so yeah. winsome. They can get a dealer at a show to trade or trade because, yeah. oh, it's a kid and the kids just take them all in the bank. Now, you can't always get away with that in your 20s and 30s and 40s, but in your teens or your preteens. You were talking and you said they want to collect what the big boys want to collect. But it does bother me that, look, we're fortunate the life we live. I joke with my wife, when I die and come back from not, you know, to heaven, I want to come back as my kid. And I wish they had some sort of deal where... A kid could get a voucher. They can afford wax. It's expensive. I buy it for my kid. And not everyone's in your demographic or my demographic. It's hard to police that. The other problem that you have is we don't want to commoditize it. It's not a bad idea, but to have one product that's a commodity that's available enough that it's not going to go up in price, that can backfire. So yeah. I, at this point, you're presenting kids with an opportunity for enjoyment. And I think kids are resourceful. They're going to find a way. Yeah. And uh, some of them have enterprisingly gone into soccer cards. Because, yeah. Yeah. again, if they're following and playing soccer, they can be sharper than some of the adults that are just thinking, hey, this is a good investment. But if you don't have the base of knowledge, uh, right. you're at a disadvantage to somebody that does. It's, it's interesting because I was listening to some of these podcasts, McGrath, and, and, and he's funny because he's just all philosophical. Yeah. Some of these others, some of them are so tilted, what I call the fantasization of cards where it's almost like it's fantasy football. Kyler Murray will have a great game and you, you'll see talk about it. So it's really interesting, like that day trading mentality versus other podcasts 
really talk about the collecting and some mix it and, and weave it. You have to know the personality of your kid or yourself, but some people love to follow the herd. They don't want right. to get outside the herd. They want to be close to the front of the herd. You right. certainly don't want to be at the back of the herd, but uh, then there's a bunch of them that want to follow the beat of their own drum. And, and those are the people that are going to wind up entrepreneurs that are going to yeah. say, hey, nobody's doing it quite right. I can do some disruptive thing. I, I also agreed with your comments on about kind of church and state. You didn't say that, but, but more so with fanatics and just having another watchdog there. I think it was the guy from PWCC mentioned. It's a very astute comment because then you start talking evil empire here, like Star Wars, and nobody wants that as well-intentioned as they are. It's the other thing I got into with Jason Granite is we need to kind of police and regulate our own or somebody right. else can do it for us. It's tricky because there's a lot of things in a hobby environment where you're not really doing anything illegal it's borderline unethical. If it was SEC, they're touting securities. Yeah, pumping and dumping. <laughs> to some degree, perhaps, but as long as there's no federal or government interest in it. Again, right. there's so many ways to make money, but there's some people that are really solid, well-educated managers of, of businesses. And there's some entrepreneurs that come up right. with a great idea. There's some guys that are just really promoters. <laughs> right. And they can take any idea and sell it. And there's a bunch of them in this hobby. They have a gift of gab. They're very creative, but they love marketing and promotion and they can deliver. And in sure. the market, they're looking brilliant. I'm going back to when I got back in the hobby, maybe eight years ago. And I love the unopened pack, just the dream of what it entails, just the opening and smelling the cards, all that stuff. So I started buying some unopened cellos. So I got lucky. I got like a Jim Brown on open cello rookie, some interesting stuff, but you got, I got it some, early enough. Yeah. Yeah. But, but what's funny though is I got a couple Elway, Elway in a Montana from eBay. They're PSA slab. They're one of one Elway on the front and Elway on the back rookie. No, here, here's what gets interesting. I just joined a group on Facebook the other day. Again, when you know I was growing up in the hobby, this didn't even exist. And some people explained to me that this is actually fake. Because the way the sheets are cut, they said basically the unopened top cellos are put together from select card sheets on each end of the cello. So if cards from a B sheet should not be on the top and bottom of a pack, they said, knowing the, the order that all these came through, they're like, we think it's fake. And I wrote back, well, hey, Steve Hart authenticated it because he's the only guy that PSA uses. So I think I'm going to have to reach out to PSA and because I don't want to sell those in good conscience, to your point, that's just not the right thing to do. But um, PSA yeah. has got to be held accountable. Baseball card exchange said it was good. Did they wrap it? It's in a PSA holder. Well, then, then they're standing behind it. You're trusting them. I've had some nice pieces of memorabilia and things over many decades now. Oh, no doubt. Where I've had people tell me they've questioned the authenticity of something in order to lower the price. Huh. They say, well, I, I don't. Yes, it'd be worth this much if we were sure it was authentic. But it's possible that it isn't. I, I think you, you need to moderate your price a little bit. Yeah, so yeah, maybe that's going on. I don't know. But uh, yeah. that's why it's good to have a third party, dispassionate view, which uh, PSA and, uh, and Steve Hart would be. You've done your part. Yeah, it's amazing, though. What, what I hope Fanatics doesn't do is there's a lot of micro printers that have come out of this. And I hope they don't flush that person out. The kid that wants to start his podcast, the couple guys that want to rip and do their breaks, because that, that, that's what's great about this country, right? Anyone can get their side hustle going and try to do something. It's nice. I don't think they're going to put the small guys. It's more the, the big guys or yeah. in Jefferson, the not the shops even, but the very large breakers. The big breaker, yeah, it, yeah. It's hard to compete. They just have such a competitive advantage. And same thing on the grading. On the other yeah, hand, oh, no doubt. Fanatics almost wouldn't be a true third party authenticator and a, and a grader. Right. They'd be a first party. <laughs> right, right, right. We had grading contracts back in my day with all the major card companies. And they'd say, wait, how come they're not all tens? I say, dude, your quality control, they're not perfectly centered, or you had some scratches on this. A lot of them are tens or 9.5s, but there's a bunch of nines in there too. Most of the companies have their quality control down pretty well now, but. Yeah. It's not like you could just automatically say they're going to be tens coming off the line. When did you decide and why did you decide to sell your business? They said, what is your uh, exit strategy or your succession plan? I said, I, I, I don't have one. This is my life. This is what I'm going to do. I'm never going to sell. And they said, what if somebody offered you a lot of money? I said, there's no amount of money. <laughs> so it's just so arrogant. So they said, and all these guys were my age at that point and, and pretty seasoned. They said, you are not your company. And there may come a time based on your personal circumstance where you'll think, maybe I should consider this. Then you'll be surprised. There'll be some people writing you a check that will not necessarily change your life because you're already pretty set. 
But yeah. when I sold my company, I got margin back. I had more stress in my life than I realized. I'd, Did you have any blockages before that? I'm curious. I had high cholesterol, but I had really high HDL too. So my ratio okay. wasn't that bad. But, and my mom has real high cholesterol. HDL is good, right? She's 96. So I have no family history. My dad is 96. So I've got great genes, but I have a brother four years younger than me and he's doing fine and three sisters. So I don't really have family history, but I underestimated my stress because I only thought stress was negative stress. And in reality, stress can be positive in the sense that when I look at when I was at work, we were having victory after victory. Not that I was a big celebrator, but it was exhilarating. The adrenaline's pumping at work. Then I go home and have a little bit of negative stress. But that weighs very heavily because- it'll, yeah. yeah. So my adrenaline was stuck, I think. And so right. uh, then I had a heart attack on the weekend that I in the morning. For 40% of guys, the, the first symptom of a heart attack is sudden death. You don't get a second chance. Right. I got to the hospital and three minutes later, I dropped dead. And there was an off-duty cardiologist walking down the hall, just finishing his Sunday morning rounds. And he gave me the clot busting stuff. I still have a couple stents, but I didn't even need to have open heart. So I do what the doctors tell me and I, you know, haven't had any problems since. So they resuscitated you from death? Yeah. yeah. I coded out. And God. Uh, so God wouldn't, God wouldn't finish with me. Yeah. I bet a day doesn't go by. You just thank God that you've got the day ahead of you. You know that? Yeah. Yeah. I take it a day at a time. There's a saying, God redeems all he allows. Either God is sovereign or he's not. And if he's sovereign, you think, why is all this bad stuff happening? It's right. part of a greater plan that I don't know. No doubt. Uh, so I've got this, so life isn't perfect, but uh, and you can't tell your wife she's perfect because then she has nowhere to go but down. <laughs> <laughs> Good advice. But, but she is terrific. Do you find it cumbersome? And do you almost wear like a different color hat and some shades when you go to these shows? To, or Because it's got to get old. Like I know you like these dollar bins and people got to be bugging you. Is it just frustrating sometimes or it's just par for the course? I'm a friendly introvert. So I just take it as it goes. I don't go out of my way to shake every hand, but I'm pleasant when I see somebody that I've known for a long time. But I sold my company 17 years ago, so I'm not in the limelight. But people will come up sometimes and I'll visit with them. And I, the podcast has been a great outlet to nice. reconnect with some of the people who used to work for me and people in the industry. And I have a new mission to influence the influencers. And I love to have interesting guests on. And, and I've got people who used to work for me that work for other places in the industry. And, and It's like that coaching tree in the NFL. I think so. <laughs> yeah. We had a dream team back in the day and they're dispersed around. But it, yeah, I'm a lifer. But going to shows, and I'll sit in a chair and go through some of the boxes. And then I'll walk around and just rotate around, visit with some people. I, I make some new friends occasionally, but I'm not that much of a people person that I want to go to a show and right. you know, all people stuff and no card stuff. All those years I had the company, I really couldn't do cards. I just had to be an executive. Right. So and, it and it's hard to... promoted upstairs. You're the owner and you right. can't afford to do things you enjoy. I've always thought there's got to be something in the scriptures or some story that you're in the candy store, but you can't eat any of it. I'm not going around saying, Hey, here's who I am. I'm trying to be one of the guys. It's, it's, I've actually been selling because I think I want to get it down to 20 really cool cards or pieces. I know that sounds crazy, but I just want to try to focus on some core pieces because that'll be the chase. I admire you if you can narrow it down to 20. <laughs> it's, hard. Listen, it's hard. But people say, what are you looking for? So I'm looking to sell stuff because I, I'd like to get down to 20. I don't think I could. I know. I, don't I, think I love I your plan. To 2000. So I love your plan. 1% or 10% a year. What was it? I love well, it. Well, 1% a month and I'm failing of that, but I'm making some progress. What do you think is the black swan event that no one in the hobby is thinking about? I'm curious. I did the episode about the seven existential threats. Yeah. I think that was on September 11th, but people think, uh, you know what? These vintage players, Don Mattingly, he can't really mess up. He's a good guy. Right. You know, right. He's, there are existential threats to our way of life. And right, right. the fact that the hobby. And so noting those things, but other than some of those seven things, basically, this is a lovely hobby that people can enjoy and make friends uh, in and around the, the sport and the collecting and the rarities and the pursuit and the stories. And I hope it just stays like that. Oh, and those threats are all isolated and probably unlikely, but they're possible. Now, I was 